Um, ladies and gentlemen, my pleasure, well, you've already met Emily, but I'm going to introduce her um, properly. Emily Maguire, Chief Executive Officer of DVRCV. Uh, she has extensive academic policy and program experience in working to prevent and respond to violence against women and promote gender equality. Emily's worked at Our Watch, the Australian Human Rights Commission, Vic Health, Casa House, and across a number of government departments, including the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Education. Um, Emily will be the first speaker in the first plenary session uh, dedicated to what is violence against women uh, and what does it mean in my work. So please welcome her back, Emily Maguire. So, as I said, the purpose of me being here today and the other plenary session presenters is to make sure that we've all got a shared understanding, not only of what family violence looks like and how we can recognise it in all its forms, but also so we can understand the impact that family violence has, both on children and adults, because I think it's not often, um, it's sometimes not only until we really understand just how serious something is that we're actually kind of... Um, energised to take action and, and encourage the skill to take action. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time defining family violence for us so we're all on the same page, talk about what the research tells us um, about the prevalence of family violence in Australia and give you some information about the impacts of family violence um, primarily on adults. Sessions in the afternoon we'll talk um, more specifically about children. Um, in, other, in other presentations today, as well as in the workshops, you'll be um, given information and be able to workshop information about recognising the warning signs and how to have the face-to-face -face conversations with women. So I'm not going to go through anything um, of that practical nature today. It is really just talking about the issue itself. So the legislation that guides um, us in the family violence sector uh, is the Family Violence Protection Act and it outlines what family violence is. What's important to note about the legislation, I assume that... Um, there's not many legislative docs in the room like me who have read the whole thing. But it's important to note that in the preamble, what it does, what the Protection Act does is outline the social context within which family violence takes place. And so while the language in the legislation is necessarily gender neutral, because we know that anyone can experience family violence and family violence is defined more broadly than intimate partner violence, you'll hear me and others using those terms interchangeably today, um, the preamble is intended to guide the interpretation of the legislation, particularly in courts, but also by um, other people who are, who are coming into contact with the legislation, and it really clearly outlines the gendered nature of what we're talking about, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. So the Family Violence Protection Act says that family violence is any behaviour that is physically, sexually, emotionally, psychologically or economically abusive, is threatening or coercive, controls or dominates, or causes fear for the safety of well-being of someone, a person, or, or, or someone else in their, in their friend or family network. So it's a really broad definition, as you can see. Um, and it's intentionally broad, because what we actually know is that um, family violence is really most often a pattern of coercive and controlling behaviours rather than a one-off incident um, at peak times. Um, the Family Violence Protection Act also says that a child is experiencing family violence if he or she witnesses, hears or is exposed to the impacts or the aftermath of any of those behaviours listed there. So this can be anything from um, having to help your mum clean up or um, her cover up bruises to cleaning up um, broken glass to hearing your father undermine your mother's parenting. All of those sorts of things are constituted as family violence in the legislation. Um, as the, as the Protection Act alludes to, there are a range of different forms of, of violent and abusive and controlling behaviour um, that perpetrators of family violence use. I'm not going to go through all of these, I think they're probably fairly self-explanatory, but what I just do want to um, have you holding in your heads today is that um, not only will you not necessarily always see the results or the impact of family violence on a woman's body, you sometimes will but you sometimes won't, you often actually won't see any of these behaviours because they'll occur behind closed doors. You may have a lovely father who comes into your centre. He also may be violent towards his partner. Family violence, as everyone knows, is actually much more than physical. And what women actually tell us is that often it is the non-physical behaviours, that constant, daily, threatening and undermining and terrifying coercive control that is much more serious for them and has a much more serious impact on their long-term health and wellbeing. Um, I want to take a minute to quickly talk about um, language before I speak to this information on this slide. You'll notice as I talk and as I think uh, when others talk during the day that we use or I use the female pronoun instead of talking about victims or victim survivors. 
That's not to suggest that men don't experience family violence or that family violence doesn't occur in, in same-sex relationships. But what the research tells us is that violence between um, people who were in and or currently are in an intimate heterosexual relationship is probably the most common form of violence and that's why the majority of family violence services focus on, on, on women in particular. So how is violence generally in Australia about gender? Women and men actually have quite radically different experiences of violence. Um, men are more likely to experience violence from a stranger uh, and it's more likely to be in a public place. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to experience violence from someone who is known to them, and whether that is a neighbour, a boyfriend, an ex-partner, a date, a father, a brother or a son, um, it is someone who is known to them is the most common experiences that women have, and mostly women's experiences of violence happen in private and primarily in their home or someone else's home. And it's important to remember, we often talk about victims and, and we get ourselves um, we spend a lot of time talking about victim survivors of violence and focus on them, and as we should, but actually what that does is makes the perpetrator of this sort of violence invisible. Um, and so what I also want to point out is that in both cases, violence experienced by men and by women, most of that violence is perpetrated by other men, 97% in fact. So we actually, what the data tells us is that not all men are bad and not all men are violent, but that we have got a really significant problem with masculinity in this country and we need to figure out different ways of raising our boys. And so some of the sessions this afternoon will be designed to talk about that and some of the things that Nellie was raising this morning are about those gendered expectations. Um, and just another quick note is that when it comes to family violence and intimate partner violence per se, as defined by Victorian legislation, that particular type of violence is most likely to, again, be perpetrated by men, but it's most likely to be perpetrated by men against women as opposed to perpetrated by men against other men. The most important thing that I think I'd like you all to take away from, um, from today and from my presentation in particular is that family violence is a choice. It doesn't result from men getting angry, it doesn't result from stress, it doesn't come from um, experiencing poverty. And not only is family violence a choice, it's actually something that men do purposefully to exert power and control over their partners. The power and control wheel, which is here, but not intended for you to read it, that's why it's very small text, but it's something that you'll see if you go to any family violence training, and you'll often see it at, at DVRC's training. It identifies not just the different forms of violence against women or different types of violence, but actually talks about the myriad of ways in which men um, use control and domination to exert power over their female partners. Um, and the point I'd like to make is that power and control in particular is the dynamic that makes family violence different from um, arguments or heated discussions or any of the other euphemisms you sometimes hear used. Yes, people argue in relationships and that's fine, that's okay, that's what happens. But family violence isn't actually about arguments. Um, it's not about fighting, even though that's actually often how this issue is portrayed. He got really angry because she made him angry. Family violence is actually a, a very concerted, repeated pattern of coercive and controlling behaviour that is designed to scare, to dominate and to exert power over someone. So how prevalent is it in Australia? This data is drawn from an in-depth analysis by ANROSE, Australia's National Research Organisation into Women's Safety. Um, and it's the kind of the best population level data we have in this country. It's taken from um, uh, data uh, developed by the personal, uh, sorry, developed by the ABS, Australian Bureau of Statistics, through the Personal Safety Survey, which is our, our national survey that happens once every three years or four years, I think it is. So um, the, the kind of in-depth statistical analysis conducted by ANROSE showed that one in four Australian women have experienced intimate partner violence, so family violence from an intimate partner, who they may or may not have been living with, and that's 2.2 million women in total. One in three Australian women have experienced sexual violence, and that's a total of 1.7 million women. Over half a million women who had experienced violence from their partner said that their child or children, plural, had seen or heard that violence. And more than 400,000 women have experienced violence uh, from their intimate partner during pregnancy. So if you add up all those numbers, and my maths is bad, so I've just done it generically, that's nearly five million women and hundreds of thousands of children who have experienced violence since the age of 15. So this is, and I'm sure you're all on board with this, that's why you're here today, this is a huge problem. But what I would also want you to remember is that um, 
the, the prevalence and the severity of family violence is different in different communities. It's higher for women from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, higher for women from cultural, culturally and linguistically diverse communities, and for women with disabilities. For example, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are up to 45 times more likely to experience violence, and hospitalisation rates for women in those communities are 34 times higher as a result of injuries they experience from family violence. And what's important to remember when you're thinking about this sort of data um, and thinking about the cultural context within which violence occurs is that these stats aren't higher in these communities because men are bad in these communities. Actually, a lot of the violence perpetrated against Aboriginal women is perpetrated by white men. But rather, the more frequent and more severe and more significant impacts of violence on women in these communities as are as a result of things like barriers to accessing support services, in some cases and in some communities, um, experiences of social isolation or having more limited social power than other women who are experiencing violence as a result of colonisation or racism. There are language barriers, there are barriers around um, accessing particular visa categories and there are other barriers to safety. For example, um, having limited access because you have communication difficulties if you need a translator or you, a woman with a disability who uses a communication aid. Women are also more or less at risk of particular types of violence depending on their age. And this is something that's often left out of our kind of narrative around violence. Young women aged um, 15 to 24, for example, are the most likely of women of any age group to experience sexual violence. And further, life stage can also be really important when thinking about the context within violence happens, um, and particularly for women who are more at risk of violence or more at risk of, of experiencing serious violence, inc including lethal violence. And so the, um, the example that we offer news here is that women who are during pregnancy, um, after the birth of a child or while a woman is um, aiming to immediately prior to and post separation, that is a really significant time of heightened risk, both for the severity of violence and for violence to, um, to start escalating. So because our conference today is also looking at early childhood educators as staff members and early childhood sector as workplaces, I just want to quickly touch on um, some of the data about workplaces. It's fairly limited in this country um, and it's a little bit old. The data I've got is from um, 2012 and 2011 and we do need new information but this is the best that we've got at the moment. Um, and I think it's particularly um, in this context for us important to look at the workplace data in the context of the highly feminised sector we have both in my, in my sector, in the family violence sector and looking out here today in the early childhood sector as well. So ABS data shows us that um, two thirds of women reporting recent family violence are in paid employment. And so really what that means is that workplaces, for, for CEOs, for boards, for managers, we really need to start treating this issue as a workplace issue because it does have impacts on, on your staff and on your colleagues. So let's just move quickly to talk a little bit about the impacts of family violence. Um, on women and children, women in, in particular, but also on um, our society more generally. I think that's something that we need to start recognising as well. When we think about impacts, we mostly really think about the impacts on the victim or her children in terms of things like health or education. We don't often think about economic impacts, um, but the reality is, is that this form of violence is hugely expensive to our country, costing the Australian economy $21.7 billion each and every year, and that cost is set to significantly increase on an annual basis. Um, victims themselves actually bear the bulk of this cost in terms of um, their court services, health services, workplaces, etc. But governments actually bear the second highest amount, which is estimated at $7.8 billion each year. And whilst it's exceptionally wonderful to see the huge commitment that the Andrews government has to family violence, what we're talking about is $572 million announced by the Andrews government versus the $7.8 billion it costs the Victorian economy. So we really need to think differently about how we fund this issue. On top of the huge economic burden, women also face significant health issues as a result of the violence that they experience. There are fatal impacts of violence, as I'm sure you've all heard and seen about, and the Destroying the Joints Counting Dead Women project, um, so including domestic homicide and suicide. But there are also non-fatal impacts to women's physical, reproductive and mental health. Further, women who experience violence are actually more likely to engage in other risky health behaviours, such as smoking, drinking and poor eating habits. <coughs> 
And women who experienced an ongoing coercive control of family violence are, are significantly more likely than any other women in the, in the Victorian population to experience depression and anxiety. In fact, research conducted by VicHealth um, in 2004 showed that the biggest impact on the health and well-being of Victorian, this is Victorian data, Victorian women aged 15 to 44 was intimate partner violence. So what we know, thanks to this work, is that women's health, uh, sorry, uh, that intimate partner violence is actually more harmful to Victorian women's health than many other well-known risk factors, more harmful than smoking, more harmful than obesity, more harmful than heart disease, more harmful than cancer. You might think that that makes sense in looking at the health burden, violence can result in bruises and broken bones, um, so it's no wonder um, that it's the leading cause of death, disability and illness in Victoria. But actually the biggest uh, health burden in kind of health language imposed by intimate partner violence on women's health is uh, the burden on their mental health. So if you look at this data, depression is 35% of the health burden and anxiety is 27%. So it's almost 60% of, of the significant health issues that women face. So well, what we're saying is, in other words, if you take intimate partner violence away from women's lives, they will have more money, but they will be healthier. There are a lot of um, non-health impacts as well of family violence. These are uh, some that you perhaps may well be more familiar with. Um, women have disrupted careers, are more likely to work in casual and part-time employment, and that can often come with um, financial implications. And we know that um, not having uh, consistent employment or not having s sufficient income is one of the barriers that women face to leaving their partners. And on top of the impacts for individual employees at work listed here who are experiencing family violence, there are also impacts for workplaces as a whole. Those range from anything like um, reputational damage if you are not supportive of the victim survivors who are working in your workplace or for many organisations, as you can probably think of a couple, who are actually employing perpetrators in, um, as staff. It could be things like high staff turnover or it can be issues like absenteeism and presenteeism, just being at work when you're sick or you're not functioning effectively. Family violence is also the biggest cause of homelessness in Australia. A third of housing clients have experienced family violence and the majority of those people were women and children aged under 14. And then there are all the impacts that are um, less tangible but probably not less obvious to you given your work. Um, and this is less tangible just particularly because we've got fairly limited longitudinal data in Australia. What we do know though is that for both women and children experiencing family violence, either as a child or an adult, has um, a really significant impact on things like access to primary, secondary and tertiary education and, and retention within formal education structures. So as you can imagine, there are really quite significant individual, social and economic impacts. And as Nelly alluded to, these things often last for much longer than the actual experience of violence occurred. You can be experiencing these sorts of things 10 years after the violence in your relationship has stopped and you've managed to leave. I know this is a really heavy topic. I often have to talk about this and I really struggle to balance the need to give everyone information that's accurate and, and relevant to the work that you're doing and really not just depressing the heck out of everyone because this is a really depressing topic. It's astounding to me that we still have to have these conversations. Um, but I want to... Um, what I want you all to remember are a couple of things as we go through the day and as you're feeling a little bit heavy after I've done all of this talking. One is that we now know more than ever about the prevalence and impacts of family violence and what that means is that victims are increasingly likely to get a good response from whoever they talk to. Reports are increasing, formal reports, which means that more women are accessing safety and justice and what that also means is that more perpetrators are being held to account for their behaviour. We have a really, really strong body of work that our watch will talk about later that tells us what we need to do to prevent this sort of violence from ever happening in the first place. And lastly, I want you to remember, and particularly if this is the first time that you've had um, all of this information about family violence thrown at you in such detail, is that this conference is really specifically designed by DVRC and CCC to give you the information that you need to help support children who you're working with, to help support the families you're working with, and to know how to create a culture um, in your early childhood services that mean that you are um, addressing the underlying drivers of, of family violence. So, don't be too depressed, there will be strategies that we'll be able to help you with, um, but I think this is an exceptionally important issue and it's really wonderful to have all of you here today again, so thank you.